is being live streamed on the lead city council youtube channel so the public can observe the meeting without needing to be present north and east plans panel deals with applications from from the north east and the east of the city the aim of the panel is to hear all the relevant information from applicants members of public and the council officers to help members of the panel to make decisions could i now invite members and officers to introduce themselves and mute your microphone once you have introduced yourself so i'll start from my left daniel hi daniel strode planning officer in the minerals energy and waste team good afternoon my name is louise white i'm the team lead of, um, for minerals and waste and energy planning Afternoon, Andrew Fosbury, Highways Development Control Officer for the East. Good afternoon, uh, Councillor David Jenkins from Killingbeck and Sipcroft Ward. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ray Jones. I'm the Council for Horsforth. Uh, good afternoon, Councillor Jules Hesselwood representing Wheatwood Ward. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councillor Michael Miller representing Kippex and Methley Ward. Good afternoon, I'm Councillor Jim McKenna, representing the Army Ward. Good afternoon, I'm Daniel Illingworth, part of the Plans Panel team. Good afternoon, Councillor Lynn Buckley, representing Old Woodley Ward. Good afternoon, Councillor Barry Anderson, Adlan Wharfdale Ward. Good afternoon, I'm Debbie Oldham, and I'm from Governance Services, Clark to the Panel. Good afternoon, my name is Amy Davis, I'm the legal officer for the panel today. Good afternoon, my name is David Newbury, I'm the lead planning officer for the plans panel. Thank you. Uh, can we now move on to item one? Can I ask Debbie to, if she can take us through item one to five, please? Thank you, Chair. Under agenda item one, there are no appeals against the refusal of inspection of documents. Agenda item two, there's no exempt information. Agenda item three, there are no late items. Under agenda item four, could I ask members to declare any interests? I'll take silence as there are none. Under agenda item five, we have apologies from Councillor Sharp and Stevenson and Councillor Buckley is in attendance for Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Chair. Right, before we move on to the... Uh... Today's uh, meeting. Can I ask the uh, legal services if they can uh, uh, present the case before we move on, please? Thank you, Chair. Before we start today's meeting, as members know, as a result of the local and regional elections being called for the 2nd of May, currently we are in the pre-election period of heightened sensitivity. The Chair has asked me to advise members that the purpose of the pre-election period is not to prevent the Council carrying out its normal business, but it is to prevent the business conducted by the Council being used, or having the potential be, to be perceived as being used, to secure any electoral advantage. As such, please treat this as a normal plans panel meeting, but be mindful of debate that amounts to, or could reasonably be perceived to amount to, electioneering. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can I also uh, remind members uh, to thank Councillor McKenna since it's his uh, last meeting before he, he retires. Uh, all the work that he has done, not only in this plan panel, but also uh, many plan panels previously in this city. So thank you, uh, Jim, on behalf of this particular plan, plan panel. So move on to the item six, uh, which will be presented by uh, Danielle. So you want to take the lead? The... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Councillor McKenna, I... Sorry about this. <laughs> Can we now move on to item six? Minutes of the previous meeting held on the 28th of February, 2024. Do members accept these minutes to, as a correct record? Yeah, thanks for moving, Councillor Jen Jenkins and Councillor uh, uh, Anderson for seconding. Any matters from uh, arising from the minutes? No. In that case, shall we move on to item seven then? Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, Chair. Good 
This planning application is for a battery energy storage system and associated infrastructure located on land to the north of Alton Bywater and to the west of Barnsdale Road. The application is referred to the plans panel at the request of Kipax and Methley members, Councillor Lewis and Councillor Harland. So this shows the application site outlined here in red. Um, it covers an area of almost two hectares and is within the green belt. Um, it's positioned 325 meters north of Alton Bywater with Leadstone one kilometer to the east and Kipax is 1.5 kilometers to the north. Access to the site is from the A656 Barnsdale Road, close to the property known as Low Lodge, and an existing electricity substation known as Leadston Substation. Um, Low Lodge, along with its gate piers and wall, is Grade 2 listed. Um, the other listed property within the vicinity is the Grade 2 listed barn at Home Farm, which is 500 metres to the north, um, and the Grade 1 list listed Leadston Hall and its registered parks and gardens are located one kilometre to the northeast. So should be noted that the applicant received plan permission from City Plans Panel in 2021 for a solar park, which covers an area of 88 hectares of land. So shown here in red is the solar park application area. Uh, the proposed development lies within the very southeastern corner of the solar park and would share infrastructure that's associated with it. Um, so whilst the solar park represented inappropriate development within the green belt and was considered harmful to the openness of the green belt, the solar park's renewable energy benefits meant that very special circumstances existed to clearly outweigh the harm to the green belt and all other harm. So this image here um, shows the land where the application site is located. Um, as shown on the right hand side, you can see Barnsdale Road, and there's also the property uh, Low Lodge and the Leadstone substation, which are both located close to the roadside. The site is open agricultural land, bounded to the south by a row of electricity pylons, which are in the southern section of the field uh, shown here. So this shows um, the proposed site entrance using the existing field access off Barnstar Road between the gateposts of Low Lodge. Um, this is also the approved access for the solar park, which is to be upgraded. So again, this is showing the um, access into the, the field where the application site is located. Um, you can see on the left hand side, there's the um, hedge around the existing substation. This shows a view across the application site. Um, and on the left is the hedge, which is around the property low lodge. Um, and you can see that the, well, the application site is located next to this row of pylons you can see here. So this shows the proposed site plan. The proposed development is for a 40 megawatt battery energy storage system and planning permission is sought for a duration of 40 years. To provide some background, battery energy storage systems store energy which can be released as electricity into the grid when it is needed most. Electricity storage can be used in connection with renewable generation such as solar to help provide a more constant supply of electricity into the grid. Um, shown on the plan here, the development includes a battery storage compound, uh, which is on the very uh, left hand side. There's a substation compound, which is shown in grey here, and there will be a water containment area, which is shown in, in green, um, as well as the access track. There will also be cabling to connect the proposal to the uh, Leadston substation, which is by uh, Barnsdale Road. So this shows the indicative elevations of the proposal, showing the proposed batteries, um, as well as the proposed substation. 
So there are 32 batteries and 16 inverters proposed. Um, as shown here, they are to be housed in containers which have a simple form and will be aligned into rows. Containers are 2.4 meters by six meters will have a maximum height of 4.5 meters, accounting for any roof mounted cooling units. This shows the proposed substation. Um, this in includes electrical equipment of an outdoor switch gear and transformer. There will also be a substation control building, which has a pitched roof, as well as two uh, water tanks. Um, it should be noted that this is shown entirely as has already been approved under the Solar Park application. The applicant has agreed to a landscaping scheme which includes to the north of the site the planting of 81 trees, hedgerow and scrub planting. To the west and south of the site will be a hedgerow managed at a height of six metres. The proposal also includes security fencing and pole mounted CCTV and that no lighting is proposed. So here are um, visualizations of the development um, shown from Barnsdale Road. Um, the lower image shows the site uh, once the proposed planting has reached full maturity. This shows the approved layout of the solar park um, application. Um, as you can see on this plan, the very bottom of the screen, I might try and hide this so that you can see my cursor, so the very bottom of the screen here, um, you can see the substation, which has already been approved, um, but it also forms part of this application. And to the left of that will be the proposed uh, battery units. The application has received objections from Ward Council Lewis and Ward Council Harland on grounds that the proposal would be harmful to the purposes of the Greenbelt and that very special circumstances have not been met. There is also an objection from the local MP, Great and Little Preston Council and Kipax, Pan uh, Kipax Parish Council. There is clear objection to the application from local residents with 909 objections received in total. This includes a further two new objectors since last week. The main concerns raised relate to harm to the Greenbelt and fire safety. With regard to the Greenbelt, according to the MPPF, the proposal is inappropriate within the Greenbelt and it would lead to the encroachment of countryside and loss of openness. The application therefore requires very special circumstances to exist to outweigh the harm um, to the Greenbelt and all of the harm. The case for very special circumstances put forward by the applicant includes an alternative site assessment, which demonstrates that at present there are no sites outside of the Greenbelt and Leeds which can accommodate this proposal. The site also maximizes the benefits of the solar development through co-location and sharing infrastructure. There will also be a biodiversity net gain of 76% in habitat units and 171% in hedgerow units. There are environmental benefits associated with energy storage, which are widely recognized. The national grid state that battery storage technologies are essential to speeding up the replacement of fossil fuels with renewable energy. Battery storage is also given support in planning, planning practice guidance. Um, the benefits of the proposal therefore carry significant weight. With regards to fire safety, as many objectors have pointed out, in the UK, there was a fire incident at a battery storage facility in Liverpool in 2020. Last August, planning practice guidance was updated, advising local planning authorities to consult their local fire service and consider guidance produced by the National Fire Chiefs Council. Throughout the application process, there has been consultation with West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service. It should be noted that there is no objection from the local fire service. A fire safety management plan has been submitted and has been updated following the input of the fire service. The application site also incorporates a water containment area, as you can see on the plan here, um, and as part of the safety management plan to ensure that in the event of the potential fire, 
no contaminated fire water runoff would be released into the environment. It should be highlighted that as has been stated at appeal by a planning inspector, planning decisions should assume that these regimes will operate effectively. There are other controls which regulate the safe operation of such insulations and not the planning system. A condition is therefore recommended um, for a battery safety management plan to be submitted prior to first operation and for engagement with the local fire service to continue throughout the lifetime of the development. Regarding landscape and visual impact, there will be some harm to local character as the development is industrial in nature. There may be some public views available through gaps in existing vegetation. However, the harm will not be substantial on delivery of the proposed landscaping scheme. The proposed planting is considered to adequately screen the development through the significant number of trees to the north and a six meter high hedgerow to the south. In terms of noise impact, a noise assessment has been submitted, which has been accepted by our environmental health services team. A condition is recommended to confirm that post completion, noise levels do not exceed those predicted with results to be submitted to the planning authority to demonstrate compliance. Regarding heritage, the conservation team consider the proposal to be acceptable, subject to the same mitigation measures being implemented as the approved solar park. This includes the proposed landscaping scheme and a condition is recommended for design details to be submitted for the proposed buildings on site and the access road details. In relation to highways, aside from the construction period, the proposals would generate minimal traffic other than occasional maintenance vehicles. The highways team consider that the temporary construction traffic would not be severe in terms of the safe and efficient operation of the public highway. The same highways conditions are recommended for this application as the solar park approval. Uh, in terms of ecology, uh, the site comprises grassland with no habitats of principal importance on site. And as mentioned, there'll be a substantial biodiversity net gain as a result of the proposals. Conditions are re recommended from the nature team in relation to environmental management plans and monitoring reports to be submitted. It should also be noted that the proposed batteries are located within flood zone one and flood risk management team have no objection. So to conclude, whilst the proposed development is considered inappropriate in the Greenbelt and will lead to the encroachment of the countryside. There are clear benefits of the proposal to outweigh the identified harm to the Greenbelt and all other harm identified. This includes the clear support for battery energy storage systems by the National Grid and by several government publications. It is considered that in this instance, very special circumstances do exist. There will be some harm through landscape and visual impacts of the scheme and through impact on the setting of a nearby listed building, although mitigation planting will reduce this harm. The application is therefore recommended for approval, subject to conditions, including a section 278 agreement. Should the plans panel agree with the recommendation, then the application must be referred to the Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government on the grounds that the site is over one hectare and would have significant impacts on the Greenbelt. This is a cautionary measure to refer it to the Secretary of State and they have 21 days to decide to call in the application. We have received late comments, um, which includes from the Council's Climate Change and Energy Team, um, which I'll read out. So they've, they've stated, reliance on renewables dependent on weather conditions and daylight hours brings about energy supply unpredictability. Battery storage systems are a countermeasure storing surplus energy and supplying it during peak demand. A shift away from fossil fuels will result in an unprecedented demand on the grid. This also has the potential to serve as an alternative measure by supporting distributed networks, thereby not solely relying on the decarbonisation of the grid to be net zero carbon. Therefore, these systems have multiple advantages in making our future energy systems resilient and are critically advantageous in the race towards accomplishing net zero carbon. Therefore, there is general support for these kinds of applications, subject to national guidance being followed 
and other issues being assessed on balance. And the other late comment is from the Climate, Energy and Green Spaces team. Um, and they wish to confirm that they would be supportive of battery energy storage applications um, as energy storage is a key part of the journey to decarbonisation. Um, and this is supported within a number of key national documents. And they have mentioned the following three documents. Um, there's the Climate Change Committee March 2023 report delivering a re reliable decarbonised power system, the National Grid Beyond 2030 report, and the government's British Energy Security Strategy April 2020 report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, could I now invite Councillor James Lewis and Alison Davis to the table uh, to address panel on the objection to the application? Yeah, when you're ready, uh, you got four minutes between both of you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Alison Davis, and I'm here on behalf of the Save Our Villagers, All Up Bywater, Kippex and Lidston campaign group, of which there's almost a thousand members. And I'm Councillor James Lewis. I'm Councillor for Kippix and Methley Ward, which covers Ollerton Bywater, Kippix and Ledston, which are the surrounding settlements to this site. Our campaign group understands the importance of renewable energy. However, the location of the proposed BESS poses significant and devastating impacts to our village that can't be ignored. Please consider the following when making a decision on this application. Number one, the non-compliance with the NFCC regulations. Battery units should be six metres apart. They are proposed at three. Number two, there should be at least two access roads. There's one single track which is prone to frequent heavily flooding. Number two, co-location within a solar development is not essential. Best can be co-located wherever there is access to the grid. The benefit of co-location minimises the cost of infrastructure, which is only beneficial to banks. Commercial and economic reasons aren't material planning commissions and shouldn't be afforded any weight. Number three, alternative site assessments don't consider enough alternatives. Smaller best developments or brownfield sites are not considered only greenbelt. There is no evidence that this needs to be adjacent to the substation. The only benefit is commercial, which is not a material planning consideration. Number four, destruction of Greenbelt and an unwanted precedent of industrialization. If the target for Leeds is carbon neutrality and no other sites exist, it's highly likely that this site will be used for further best development because the precedent will already be set. The cumulative effect is a slippery slope and directly contradicts Greenbelt planning protections. The planning, planning officer acknowledges this in the planning report. Number five, BESS is not renewable energy and therefore not a special circumstance. The purpose of a BESS is to store energy rather than to generate renewable or low carbon energy. Therefore, only limited weight can be attached. There's no evidence that the BESS will only store green energy. In addition to the above, Banks Renewables haven't provided definitive plans on technology, materials will be decided after consent is given, and the noise assessments performed are hypothetical. Very risky, considering best technology and safety monitoring is in its infancy. This is also the very first development for banks who have no previous experience in BESS. Less than four months ago, it was proven that no special circumstances exist when the application for a 25 megawatt BESS on the opposite side of Barnsdale Road was refused. I sent you all the planning officer's report. Please afford this great evidence as this sets the precedent for preserving the Greenbelt land of Alton Bywater, Kippex and Leadston. Over to Councillor Lewis. Thank you. Um, I would just pick up one point from the officer's presentation, which is some of the mapping showing the wider residential areas. The uh, pit site to the south of the application site to the south of Park Lane is now developed completely uh, within Park Lane. There's some areas shown on development on that plan. So I just think that's uh, worth pointing out as it sort of illustrates that there are houses closer 
um, closer to the site. I think my points following on from Alison and the campaign group's comments are, are threefold, really. I think, first of all, the the fact that when myself and Councillor Harlan were putting in our objection, we were responding to emerging planning policy, I think shows that this is a very uh, new technology um, and one that I think the um, I would ask the plans panel to consider carefully around this. It isn't a um, um, it isn't a discussion around the principles of um, um, energy, how we reform the grid, how we make the grid fit for the twenty first uh, century. But it isn't looking at a application for a, a a specific site, and I think that's important to remember. As um, it was pointed out in the officer's report, we uh, have as a um, a council agreed a solar. Um, um, a solar farm on this location. I think that recognises that we all understand the need for electricity generation to move on to different methods to agree decarbonisation. But I think this is a, a, a different matter um, we are looking at. And I think, and again, the concerns Alison set out about the um, um, about the fire concerns and around the site being uh, within the green belt are ones that the panel should consider to make sure absolutely satisfied about this application and this uh, location. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you. Uh, any questions for either Councillor uh, Lewis or Alison? Councillor Hazelwood. Um, hi, yeah, I'd just like you to expand on the fire safety concerns because reading the report, there's been quite a lot of um, consultation with West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service um, who had a lot of concerns to start with. And it doesn't, uh, the, the applicant is saying that as far as they're concerned, it complies, but um, I'm not, I, I'm, I can't see a, a, an exact um, replica from, from West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue. So I just wonder if you could expand a bit on the on the fire safety concerns and where, where that's got to. Sure, just give me a second, <laughs> bring it all down. So the, the, the first main points in the NFCC, as I spoke about earlier, is that actually that guidance suggests that the battery units should be six metres apart, but in the plans they're actually three metres apart, so that, so that doesn't comply to the regulations. The, the probably the most important one is in terms of fire and access is that there should be at least two access roads. There's only one access road, which is single track, and it's actually prone, prone to heavy flooding. We did submit a numerous amount of photographs of flooding, even, even up to this year, to be fair, um, and to show that actually that that floods. So obviously, if, if there is some kind of, kind of you know, incident, then obviously it'd be really difficult for somebody to try and access that site and, and it doesn't meet the NFCC. Um, I do have further information. Just bear with me a second. Um, yeah, so the other thing I want to say is, obviously it says, um, bank, banks said that, that it, they confirmed that the requirements of the N NFCC guidance will be adhered to. Well, obviously those two first points there say that it's not been adhered to. And then the second thing is, it's actually evidenced in the Northeast Plans Panel report dated the 20th of the 3rd as well. Um, so that's in the Planning Officer's report. Uh, the NFCC states that buildings should be at least 25 metres from the batteries. Um, there is a building within 25 metres of, of this. Whether it's unmanned or not is immaterial. Um, the other thing is that the suppression system hasn't been yet selected. So how can that be determined to be appropriate? Because all of this technology has been decided after the event. Councillor Hazelwood, are you okay with that or do you want to follow up? Sure. I think I won't repeat what Alison said and, and, and a lot of it is in the uh, papers. I do think this underlines the point around establishing very clearly around this site um, the panel satisfaction uh, that it is um it is an appropriate um it is an appropriate development to um grant permission to build and operate if if like i say there's um 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 like i say there are still some gaps in the uh in the um fire uh, management plan for this site particularly around the suppression system which is pretty critical obviously the last thing um anybody wants is to get to position where the um where the fire service is having to get involved but again if if part of that is a fire suppression system in terms of managing the site and i think there's still some questions there could I just add one final thing also? Sorry. Um, the NFCC guidance states that vegetation should be managed to limit fire risk. However, the applicant uh, man says that they'll manage it, but in other documentation, it states that that vegetation will only be managed for five years. Thank you, Councillor Jones. 
as a former resident of Allen Bywater, I know that bit quite well. And I've seen that field flood two and a half feet before now, as it's at the bottom of Butt Hill. It is Butt Hill, if I remember rightly. I'm quite surprised that the original planning permission was given that to be perhaps was because I'm aware of how bad that that area all the way into Castleford floods. So I'm slightly surprised on a single track, if anything goes wrong, what access is going to be given and how are people going to be able to get on that site. I find, and the entrance, to be honest, is very narrow as you get into there. And also, if the building did take place, it would cause considerable problems to traffic going up towards Leadston to be absolutely. So I'm concerned on that element, but just confirming that that field on a pretty regular basis does fall. Thank you. I think the, um, I mean, I, I mean, I think we need to be clear there's a, a permission given for a solar farm and clearly the operation of a solar farm is very different to the operation of a battery energy storage system. But um, you're right, it's Barnsdale Road or Mary Panel Hill for people who've lived in the area um, might know it as. Uh, those fields are um, um, having, with recent climate change, become very prone to um, having a lot of, uh, not just flooding at, at, at times of high rainfall, but a lot of standing water uh, in them as well. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. I don't know whether, which of the two wants to answer the question. Maybe Councillor Lewis may have greater knowledge or may not. But in terms of paragraph 145, the third bullet point, it says there are no suitable uh, sites located uh, out of the out with the green belt, which is which is a comment there. And then on paragraph 153, it goes on that an alternative site assessment has been carried out. Did the applicants disclose, and this is why I was inferring that maybe Councillor Lewis was given this information as a member, did the applicants disclose the alternative site they looked at? That's question one. And question two, are you saying that as a principle, Leeds shouldn't be developing Bessies and it's inappropriate irrespective of where it is, not just in this area? Or are you saying that there are alternative sites elsewhere in the city that this mess could be put in? I think your first question is probably one for officers or the applicants, um, Councillor Anderson. Uh, in terms of um, availability of sites, I mean, clearly, um, um, clearly, there is nothing, so I don't believe there's anything so unique about a battery energy storage system that it has to be um, at this location, other than, as previously discussed, the co-location with the um, solar farm that has permission, though it's not been um, built yet. Uh, in terms of your second question, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely not saying uh, these systems shouldn't be built anywhere in Leeds. I made it very clear, you know, this isn't a discussion around... Um, we're not in a development plans panel meeting here discussing um, overall policy. We're here um, discussing this application and, 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 and the objection is very clear. I, I wouldn't want the discussion to move away from this site and this application because like as, as set out in the papers and um, my comments at the beginning and, and Alison Davis's comments at the beginning, we do not believe this site um, is suitable. That's not, um, like I say, we're not opening up, or I'm certainly not opening a debate about whether um, there are suitable, um, uh, about um, uh, what suitable sites there are for battery energy storage. I'm aware that, you know, in, in, in other districts, former power station sites have been used for, for, for this and things like this. There is um, still um, previously developed industrial land located around Leeds and West Yorkshire. Um, but like I say, that's not the discussion I want to have here. It is around this site and and, and, and the appropriateness. And we've covered some very specific reasons uh, just in the last few questions around the flooding and around the fact there's only one vehicle access. And I think this is very relevant to the application in front of us. If Am I allowed to add something to the first point? Because I could actually give you a bit of information about the first point, if you don't mind. Um, so... With the alternative site assessments, the size of the development has been the, been the main 
consideration when comparing to alternative sites. The proposal includes a number of alternative sites discounted because the area wasn't big enough. So further research should be done in, in, into different kinds of sites, utilising them at a smaller scale, perhaps, rather, rather than this one. It was just discounted purely because of the size of the development that the, that the developers wanted. Um, the benefit of siting it adjacent is only really due to the in infrastructure, etc. And if you look at other um, best sites actually there is um another one where the grid connection is three kilometers away from the solar site in an edf renewables in northamptonshire the grid connection is eight kilometers away and creaky beck probably the most famous one that everybody knows connects to an offshore wind farm and dogger bank is 131 kilometers from shore at its nearest point so it does not need to be co-located thank you right i can't see any any more hands so thank you very much to both of you. Uh, can I now ask uh, Rachel Hammonds uh, to come to the table, please? Again, uh, when you're ready, you've got four minutes to address to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Can everyone hear me okay? Good afternoon, everyone. I am Rachel Edmonds, a senior panel at Banks Renewables, where I've worked for over 15 years. I am passionate about delivering projects that will benefit local communities, as well, helping, as well as helping us all achieve net zero. As a project team, we have worked closely with your planning officers to ensure that our project has been sensitively designed. We are grateful for the input and advice that we have received. Your offices have conducted a robust and thorough assessment that confirms that our proposals for delivering a battery energy storage system are appropriate. We hope that you will support and approve our application this afternoon. So why batteries? Batteries are safe, clean, and highly efficient method for storing electricity. To quote the National Grid, battery storage technologies are essential to speeding up the replacement of fossil fuels with renewable energy. Batteries enable energy generated from renewable sources, such as solar and wind, to be stored and then released when power is most needed. To date, fossil fire power plants have traditionally been used to manage such peaks and troughs. Our proposed battery will therefore make a valuable contribution towards our nations, as well as your council's journey towards net zero. It will save approximately 6,900 tonnes of carbon dioxide per annum. It will, also, it will also contribute to the security of our energy supply, which has become an increasingly important consideration over the past few years. The UK government estimates that technology like battery storage systems could save the UK energy system up to £40 billion by 2050, therefore reducing people's energy bills. We're aware that concerns have been raised related to the safety aspects of batteries, particularly fire safety, which is something we've taken very seriously as a project team. We have worked with West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service on the site design. Each battery unit will have built-in fire prevention technology and the site layout has been designed to mitigate fire risk. In the extremely unlikely event of a fire, the site has been designed to eliminate fire spreading and to ensure the fire service have the information and facilities they need on site. Now we've established a need, why this location? The proposed battery is located within the boundary of the consented Barnsdale Solar Park. The site has already been found to be suitable for renewable energy infrastructure and a detailed assessment found it to be the only available site for a battery within Leeds at present. Locating the battery within the solar site allows for the sharing of site infrastructure, including the grid connection, which you will have seen this morning is located adjacent to the site. The battery will protect and significantly enhance wildlife habitats on site. New trees and hedgerows will be planted and bat and bird boxes installed. The site will achieve biodiversity net gain of 75%. The project will provide significant economic benefits for the local area. Around £7 million will be invested in the local economy and in line with our company ethos, we will prioritise the use of local firms where possible. Bank Renewables has a track record of working with local communities in Leeds. 
Our Hookmoor Wind Farm has been operating for almost 10 years and we've awarded £65,000 worth of grants to the local community over this period. In summary, there is a need for the proposed development. It will help address the nation's as well as your council's climate emergency. It is in a suitable location. The consented solar farm has established the principle of renewable energy development in this location. The battery will not extend the footprint of the solar farm. The fire safety concerns have been addressed. It has been concluded that fire risk from the proposed development is low. I hope that you will support your planning officer's recommendation and grant planning permission for the Barnsdale battery today. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, any questions? Councillor Millers. Hi there, thank you for your presentation. Um, you suggest that the fire safety concerns have been addressed. Um, on page 33, paragraph 115, the West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service uh, lays out a number of aspects of the proposal relating to fire safety, which they believe still require uh, clarification um, given the uh, recommendations set out within the National Fire Chiefs Council guidance. Um, could you explain, uh, and I'm happy to go through each bullet point uh, individually, why you've chosen to ignore uh, the recommendations and put forward a proposal which um, the West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service still has concerns with? Firstly, I'd just like to clarify that we have not ignored the National Fire Chief's guidance. We have taken account of that guidance at every step of the design of this scheme and safety has been right at the forefront of the design of the scheme. I'll perhaps just take you through the four points um, and discuss each one in turn. So I think the first relates to the selected suppression system. Now, due to where we are in the development cycle, we don't have a specific battery technology that we're going to use. We haven't selected a supplier. It'll be upon that point that we know exactly what the battery is going to be, who the supplier is going to be, that we will design the appropriate suppression system for that type of that tech, not specific technology. So that will be done in consultation with the fire service because we are committed to our ongoing engagement with the fire service. And it will also comply with the principles of the National Fire Chief's guidance, as well as the wider um, UK, European um, guidance on suppression systems. So we are committed to making sure the suppression system is in line with the guidance. It's just we can't tell exactly what that's going to be at the moment because we don't know the exact type of battery, that type of technology. Um, can I ask when you will know that type of battery? Because I think it's probably quite pertinent to our decision today to know uh, what kind of battery is being used on a battery storage facility. So apologies. To clarify, we know the type of technology. It's going to be a lithium ion battery. The supplier and exactly the, the type of lithium ion battery is not known. So we don't know who's going to supply that battery and every supplier has a slightly different configuration. The process is once the application is consented, we would then go out to tender to battery suppliers. And it's at that point, following that competitive tender exercise, that we will know which battery we're going to put on site. But we do know the type of battery is going to be a lithium ion battery. Should we perhaps move on to, to the next point in terms of the four points? Yep. So I think the second point relates to two vehicle access points. Um, there are two access points into the battery compound. Um, there's one at the east side of the compound and one at the west side of the compound. So the fire service can access the compound from both sides um, in the extremely unlikely event of, of a fire. The, the next point comes on to the, the minimum distance between units and um, the, the six metres basis. The six metre guide, the six metres set out in the guidance is set out unless suitable design features can be introduced to reduce the spacing. So the guidance is also a number of years old now and battery technology has moved on. However, the guidance does say, make reference to this suitable design features. Now, the batteries at Barnsdale will include a one hour thermal barrier will be provided 
and this fire mill barrier means that that separation distance from six metres can be reduced. The spacing proposed at Barnsdale is three metres, um, and this is actually the higher end of design spacings when you take into account the design features that will be included um, within, within the batteries. And the final point um, is the spacing between the batteries and buildings on site. The, the National Fire Chief's guidance talks about the distance from occupied buildings. And I think that's an important point. The buildings that are within 25 metres of the batteries will be related to the battery facility itself. It'll be the control building for the site, which will be un unoccupied. The closest occupied buildings to the site are circa 300 metres away, which is a significant increase on, on the 25, which is set out in the, the guidance. I hope you, that kind of brings a bit more clarity to the position. I think just also want to say that we have engaged with the fire service throughout this process. Um, we've had a number of meetings with them to discuss this and we've worked with them to refine the design of the site and we're committed to doing that moving forward. Getting consent for a, a battery in this location is not the end of our engagement with the fire service, it's just the beginning of it. We will continue to work with them prior to commencing development on site and as set out in the committee report and we've signed up through planning conditions, we will also liaise with them on an annual basis with a fire management plan um, to make sure they have any information that they need in the extremely unlikely event of a, a fire. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, can I just get some clarification on the uh, the building which you say is unoccupied? Um, will that building ever be manned at any point during the site? There will be people in the building from time to time, but it won't be a permanent office for anything. It'll be a, a base for when people are on site um, undertaking maintenance. So there will be times when there's people in the building um, but it won't be a permanent, um, permanently occupied. Thank you, Councillor Anderson, and then Councillor Hazelwood. I've got four questions. One is, we heard in the previous evidence that access to the grid isn't necessarily needs to be just in the next field. Is that correct from your perspective? Is that a can is that a factor? in deciding where you wanted to put this. Then in terms of question two, the comment was made that in terms of this best storage, that we might not, you might not be storing just green energy. Is that correct? Are you going to be storing non-green energy on this site? And then uh, you heard me asking Councillor Lewis the question about uh, the sites, the alternative sites you looked at. Did you offer to disclose to the residents and the local ward members the alternative sites that you've looked at so that they can look at them themselves to see whether or not they, how they compared. Did you offer that facility? And then the final thing is, we also heard the residents group pointing out that it is possible, we gave a wide range of alternative locations that could be looked at up to miles and miles and miles away. Have you looked at any of those miles and miles away uh, as alternatives or not? We'll work through your questions in order if that's okay. So in terms of access to the grid, um, the alternative sites assessment was based upon a kilometre to two kilometres distance from the grid connection. And that relates directly to the cost of accessing um, the grid and the feasibility of a scheme of this size. The further you are away from the grid, the more expensive it becomes. And then the larger the facility you require to, to make it viable. So for a facility of this size, you do need to be located within about a kilometre to two kilometres of the grid connection to make it to make it viable. I'll maybe pass across to my colleague Fraser in a minute to pick up the point about uh, necessary green energy coming into the battery. Um, in terms of the alternative sites assessment, that was published as part of the planning application. Um, it was submitted with the planning application and provided to the planning officer, so that should will have been available on the, the planning portal for the public. 
Um, and the scope of that alternative site assessment was agreed in consultation with the planning officers. And we looked at all potentially suitable sites within the Leeds district area, within Leeds council area. Fraser, do you want to pick up the point about the... So just to be clear, you did not look at any sites outside of the Leeds area because obviously there's a number of other local authorities nearby, and I'm not suggesting that we should necessarily get them to take it on, but did you assess any of the neighbouring authorities' land? Not in specific relation to this site. We just looked because that was agreed in terms of the scope of your planning officers. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Fraser Harrison. I'm a technical manager at uh, uh, Banks Renewables. Um, so on your... Um, uh, renewable energy point there, uh, councillor. Once energy from any generation plant, so be it coal, gas, or wind or solar, enters the grid, it, it, it loses its uh, particular kind of criteria for being picked back out again. So once it enters the electricity system, it, it, it's kind of inconsequential where that comes from. Um, the energy that the battery uses comes directly from the grid. And as a whole, in addition to other sites, other best sites, it will allow a general gradual reduction of carbon intensive uh, generation, such as coal and gas, and move more to the kind of global and UK requirements for renewable energy. So it doesn't pick out specifically renewable energy, but it does pick out energy, which, which helps the transition to uh, net zero. I'd just like to comment on your first point as well. The, the benefit of the current location um, is not just infrastructure and commercial savings. The the solar park and the best energy park can work together to provide a more efficient renewable energy service, which is why we utilise the same substation compound to generate much higher efficiency than you would with just a solar park on its own. Councillor Hazelwood. Um, yeah, thank you. For, firstly, um, can I can I just point out we're using the word unmanned. It's unstaffed, and I'm really really disappointed that we're still using words like unmanned. That language is really important. So can I please ask that we use staffing and unstaffed in the future, please? It's really important. Yeah. Um, with regards point two, um, uh, Councillor Miller, when you you went through the four points with Councillor Miller. Um, Point two regarding vehicle access, um, there is only the one access road um, we've been on site this morning. You've said that there are other points of access onto the site which the fire service could use. Um, I'm not sure from the plans where these are, but also what I am concerned about is we've heard about the flooding on that site and how it's flooded. So if we're going to have trouble getting down a track, how are we going to how how are they going to get through other points of access which aren't a, a road or a track if there was a fire? So um, it, it's okay saying there are other points of access, but I'm a bit concerned about the flooding element and and how they would access those those points. If you can tell us where they are, please. So in terms of the, the flooding point, there is a condition requiring us to submit a flood emergency plan prior to operation of the development. And it's as part of that flood, uh, flood emergency plan that we'd look to consider further in the event of a fire, the access and the secondary access there. The two access points into the compound are, are either side, side of the compound. And we are exploring the... Uh, the opportunity for a second access track to the compound as well. You okay with that, uh, Councillor Hazelwood, yeah? Okay, Councillor uh, Johns. So, as I know that area reasonably well, I don't see how you could have a secondary access point. The, the, where we are at the moment is a very narrow gate and that that road folds quite regular. That's that I don't think anybody disputes that. So I don't understand where you're going to put a second point in. Uh, that, without clarifying that, I've got enormous difficulty agreeing to anything on this, to be absolutely honest. Yep. Um, so, Councillor Johns, do you want to switch your mic off, please? Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so, so as part of as part of both the flood prevention plan and the uh, fire 
uh, engage, fire safety engagement with West Yorkshire Fire Service. We have been looking at uh, additional access points from out with the site. The guidance, um, currently the NFCC guidance has two access points, which we have distributed within the site boundary, but we are exploring other options to the west and to the north to look at a, diff a different access for all, rather than the current, the current yeah. location. Right, any other questions? In that case, thank you very much. Uh, can we now move on to uh, questions to the officers, please? Any questions? Uh, Councillor Buckley? Thank you. This is a question for highways. Uh, in the report, it says that there are going to be um, uh, increased movements of heavy goods vehicles and traffic. Um, is there any provision going to be made for reinstatement of the roads if there's deterioration due to the increase in the traffic? Because um, in our ward, there is a situation where there is some development going on, and one of the roads involved has a lot of, of increase of traffic of heavy goods vehicles, which is causing considerable deterioration of the road. So I wondered if any... Any uh, provision was going to be made in this respect for this development? Thank you. I think with this specific development, because of the numbers of lorries involved, I think just looking at the, I think it's 48 vehicle movements a day in the construction period, and that's the first two months, um, and, that, and I think that includes 18 HGVs a day, so that's roughly, whatever, 18 times... Uh, Two months, 18 times 42 two months is, but I think then you compare it to, if you're talking about the Moralton, then when you compare it to that, the numbers are a lot less. So there isn't a, we didn't condition a highway uh, condition survey because the numbers were a lot less and we didn't feel like it was it was required in this instance. So the, the, the situation is then that the you estimate that there will only be 18 uh, these vehicles per day and it will be no more because on the situation in that one, they assessed the, it and it's way above what, what was actually, what's actually happened. Yeah. And so do we have the guarantee that this is, you know, it's only going to be this amount of vehicles? Well, I guess all we can really do is go on their information and then as has happened, I think they've stopped using, they've stopped um Construction traffic, traffic has stopped on that at the moment, isn't it? Or has it started again? So I think it's been taken to enforcement because it was they were going over and above what was agreed. Right, any other questions? Councillor Anderson? A lot of questions. Can we just clarify what you said in your later information about paragraph 36, which was that originally the climate and energy team had no comments to make? And in your summing up, you so are you saying categorically now that it is the view of this this part of the council that this application should be supported? Is that what they've said? I've got a number of other questions, but is that what your synopsis said? Yes, yeah, so I think at the time when they're initially consulted, um, is that time. <laughs> Um, so yeah, time when there is the time when they were initially consulted, they just had no comment to make on the scheme. And but now um, they've informed that their, their position is that they do support the scheme. Um, obviously, it's subject to other um, considerations, which they but they are supportive of battery energy storage systems in general. The Greenbelt special circumstances, do you feel that they have been made or not? Yeah, I think there's clear, very special circumstances uh, for this application. Um, do you want me to explain? No, 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 fine. Because no, just, just, you'll see why I'm asking the, in stages like this. Um, fine. Uh, in terms of, let's just... If I can try and paraphrase a bit quicker. Right. You you felt that we should use little or no evidence, no weight, little or no weight to the emerging changes that we're going to make. That was in paragraph 57 and also in paragraph 73. Some of us who are on development plans panel put a lot of effort into trying to get this. So you're saying that we shouldn't put a lot of weight 
on the discussions that we've had there. Is that is my understanding correct? Sorry, are you talking about the emerging policy? Yeah. Um, that's only because it hasn't been um, adopted yet. So yeah. although that does show support for battery energy storage systems, um, and that is kind of in discussion with policy right now, that to have that policy in future, um, to show support for energy storage systems in general, um, subject to criteria. Right. But just at the moment in time, can't afford it. No, that's Stand fine, that's fine. Yeah. Right. The reason I'm going like that is that we all attended training courses and we were given the explicit instruction that if officers recommend approval for something and it is policy compliant, we've got to have very, very good reasons for going against the officer recommendation. So can I be clear that you are asking, you are telling me today that your strong recommendation is that this application should be approved and if I wanted to take a contrary view, I need to have very good reasons why I'm taking a contrary view based on the training that we were given. Um, yes, that's 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 the case, Councillor. Whenever whenever you're going to go against officer recommendations, obviously the the plans panel has to have very good, clear planning reasons as to why they're they're, they're coming to a, a, an alternative view. I'll try that. Um, yeah. Right, any other questions? In that case, we'll move on to comments. Uh, any comments? Councillor Millers? Um, yeah, I think it's important to, to reiterate that no members of the panel today have uh, disagreed with the concept of uh, battery and storage systems. Um, what we're being asked today is to decide whether this is an appropriate site uh, for uh, such a scheme um, and whether we've been given enough um, information today uh, to make that decision. Um, when I hear from the applicant that, um, you know, for example, two roads uh, into the site are being explored, um, I don't fully understand why that exploration hasn't already happened um, and why an answer yes or no, uh, whether they um, are willing to take on the recommendations of the West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Authority or not, um, why that decision hasn't uh, been made already. Um, and I'm concerned that there are a number of aspects of the scheme um, that are in a similar situation where we are to be told at a later date um, in particular around some of the fire safety concerns. Um, and today uh, I'm concerned uh, that we don't quite have um, that information. Um, and so I would recommend that members of the panel think carefully about whether we do have a full uh, view of the site today, given the fact that uh, battery energy storage is not only new for Leeds, uh, but it is relatively new when it comes to planning policy. Um, and we're being asked to agree to very special circumstances um, with this kind of development within the green belt, uh, despite the fact that um, if you drive less than 10 minutes from this site, you'll be in North Yorkshire Authority or you'll be in Wakefield Authority, neither of which um, based on the applicant's comments today, it looks like alternative sites have been uh, assessed within. Um, so, you know, that is assuming that it's correct uh, that there are no similar sites within Leeds. So um, in summary, I'm, I, I, I don't, just don't feel like we have enough information to make such a precedent setting uh, decision today, unfortunately. Right. Any Any other comments? As I hinted, I don't know, honestly, which way to go because I've got officers who have stated a view clearly to me, but I have some concerns. Now, are we, so I'm not, I mean, are we suggesting that we're deferring this? And if we're going to defer it, what's the purpose of deferring it? Because that would be the first thing that our senior planning officer would say is, fine, okay, what, what are the reasons that you want to defer it for? 
and what benefit would come from deferring it. Uh, can somebody help me and in, in my colleagues here coming up with reasons as to why we should defer it? Because I, I'm reluctant to approve it, but going on the advice and the training I've been on, I can't honestly in all my heart of hearts say no to it. So can somebody help me, please? Can somebody help us? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so it is something new, but one of the things that I... Obviously, while while looking at the report and listening to both the uh, uh, objectors and the uh, and 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 members, w one of the concerns which comes to my mind was the the fire safety, uh, and that's something that I have seen in my own ward, where a, a, a in a block where someone was charging a battery and that sort of caused a fire in a block of ninety nine flats. So I'm just thinking when even though we're talking about three hundred meters away from the general uh, re residential area that's something i think we need to need to bear in mind and the other thing was which was mentioned about the three meters to six meters units uh, that's another issue and the third was to do with the uh, single track wreck road so i, I mean I, i'm not putting the words into anybody's mouth here but i'm what i'm trying to help each other is that it is something new for our city but we want to make sure absolutely it's our responsibility to make sure any scheme of this nature has to be absolutely perfect, uh, and and especially the residents who live surrounding these sites. So, I'll I'll open it up if anybody has any other comments. Councillor Millers. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to propose that we defer um, on the basis that uh, the West Yorkshire uh, Fire and Rescue Authority have asked for clarification about those four bullet points. Um, obviously, I asked and we've received some clarification verbally today. We haven't received that clarification um, in detail within the report. Um, and so I'd like to have that detail. Um, one, to understand whether... Uh, they would go back and consider any of those aspects. But two, if the answer is no, um, then I'd like more detail to understand why um, it's appropriate to uh, go against the guidance. Okay, I'll uh, I'll bring Luis uh, on, on, on to this, but also uh, I was going to ask officers, is there any, any opportunity? If, if it does, if the members do decide to refer, defer it, can we get the fire services a representative of on this panel, or can't we? I mean, I don't know what the protocol is for. Or oh, and also some of the questions which were raised by the objectors. Is there any chance that uh, have some sort of clarif clarity on those issues as well? I'll bring Louis, and then I'll bring uh, you, David. Thank you, Chair. Um I think it's probably right of me at this point in time just to give you some added context to where we are with BES in Leeds. Um, so in terms of the, we do have existing facilities in Leeds which are granted. Uh, so it's not necessarily new to us as, as officers, but obviously possibly new to yourselves. And I appreciate the industry is growing quite rapidly and the BES facilities are getting much larger. Um, so we have three approved already at some um, nearly 400 megawatts on brownfield urban land, which is typically the best place to put them next to the substations. Um, it achieves the economic goals of the developer as well as obviously the public benefits to us as um, our community in terms of the electricity it stores and gives out when it's needed. We also have one existing BES already in Greenbelt as well, and that's at Howden Clough in Morley. And then in terms of one we've just refused, the opposite side of the road, as, as Alison mentioned, um, the objecting speaker, um, that was refused for very different reasons um, than what we're putting across. And it's probably worthwhile me telling you what the differences are. So the Newton Lane uh, bears on the opposite side of Barnsdale Road was refused on Greenbelt grounds because there were no very special circumstances which outweighed the rest of the harm, which I'm going to talk about as well. Um, the site was on grade three agricultural land, which is the best and most versatile, where we try and seek to protect that, obviously for food production, which is a council policy and objective. Uh, the third reason was it was harmful to the Ledsham and Ledston special landscape area. The particular site we're talking about today isn't in a special landscape area, but the opposite side of the road is, so there are absolute material differences here. 
in terms of the fourth reason for refusal for that BES, uh, there, was a, there was a lack of information and assessment, particularly in relation to listed assets and the impact on not just them directly, but the setting, whereas for this applicant's provided that information. And then the last one, there was also potential pollution. Should a fire event occur, we didn't think in accordance with the advice from West Yorkshire Fire Authority that there would be enough water containment on site that it would effectively rush off site and potentially end up in downstream pollution. Um, and we've got to be mindful of that given uh, proximity to a triple SI. Um, in, in terms of outside of Leeds, I'll just be very brief to say that there are 525 consented BES facilities in England. So that's, uh, sorry, across the UK. So that's a large amount. So whilst it's new to Leeds, they are operational and have been operational, but have particularly grown in terms of consent since 2021. Um and in terms of battery energy storage in Greenbelt, we've looked at that in terms of weighing up how inspectors have, you know, regarded proposals elsewhere and also had regard to permissions granted by other councils. And it, it, it's really in favour that BES developments within Greenbelt subject to mitigation, reduction in harm and suitable, um, very special circumstances. The, the balance has been set that it's in favour of Bezos. Now, that's not entirely all of them. As I've just said, we, we've actually recommended refusal for one um, at Newton Lane. So it, I want to specify that they are around. They're around in Leeds already. They are nationwide. However, we do look at each one on a case-by-case -case basis because whilst there might be opposite sides of the road, they are very, very different in terms of their constraints. Thank you. Thank you for that, Louis. Uh, David? Yes, thank, thank you, Chair. In, in terms of the, the fire service, we, we can obviously, if members wish us to do so, we can ask for them to attend. There is a, a bit of a health warning that I would put with that in that um, ultimately members have got to come to view on the land use, whether the, the BEZ is a, an appropriate or acceptable land use in on its own planning merits. Um, and it's also not for us as a plans panel to seek to impose or duplicate um, other, well, fire and safety regulations, as it were, and duplicate the uh, regimes that exist else, elsewhere. So although members are, can perfectly understand why members would have concerns about the fire and safety aspect of it, and it's quite right to to quiz that and satisfy yourselves that um, that they've the applicant has taken all reasonable steps to make sure that this is an appropriate facility given its location and proximity to residential properties. Ultimately, the fire and safety aspect is not a matter for us. We've got to just decide it on its land use planning terms. But having said that, obviously members have been presented with information here today that you picked up on in terms of the second access point. We haven't been um, there's no information that's before you in terms of where that's going to be, what, um, how that's going to be constructed, um, what the, how it's going to be designed generally, where the route through is, and what the implications are for the wider development. That's something that um, we we haven't got information in front of you on that. So it is perfectly reasonable to defer consideration on the points that Councillor Miller has set out those four points in conjunction with that other matter for us to then come back with um, further information at a later date for you. Thank you. Any 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 comments or Councillor McKenna? Just a very quick one, Chair. I'm uh, listening very carefully to debate. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get on the site visit. I had a chair's brief from the other planning committee at the same time but I, i'm not convinced uh, i'm not convinced that the test has been messed for putting it aside the green belt i've been on planning 36 years and i have to say that very special circumstances mean exactly that and uh, i would like to know more details about alternative sites that were looked at uh, i understand why the they want to be next to her for economic reasons, and why wouldn't they? But at the end of the day, I, I'm not convinced that uh, uh, the 
it we can set aside green belt for that. We we've, we've always been guarded our green belt. It's rapidly diminishing, and it seems to me that these uh, uh, these storage and uh, green energy, whether it be uh, uh, whether it be storage or collection, seems to be uh, wanting to locate in the green belt. You know, and I'd like. You know, if you re replicate that all over the country, then we're going to lose an awful lot of green belt, and that's my opinion on that. I would need convincing on that, Chair. Councillor Hazelwood. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, David just said that we have to satisfy ourselves that the applicant's taken all reasonable steps, and I don't think at this point that we have. Um, and I think we need uh, further information on that, uh, as he said, on that on that second access road. Um, I think we've all got concerns and um, and obviously as councillors, we always look at as well, um, you know, making sure that the communities um, that we represent uh, feel safe with whatever. That all reasonable steps have been taken. Right. The proposal has been proposed by Councillor Hazelwood. Anyone to can say? Just... Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh. Yeah, sure. If I can just collate the, the various views that I've heard around, just to make sure that we capture everything in, in the deferral when members take the vote on this. So we've got the, the four points, which are further information, the four points set out a paragraph 115 to do with fire safety. We've got further information in terms of alternative sites looking outside of the Leeds um, district with regard particularly with um, impacts in terms of the green belt. More information or fuller information in respect to very special circumstances, the case of very special circumstances, and further information in respect to the second access that's being talked about today uh, in terms of what it actually, where it will be, how it's going to be constructed, what route it would take, etc. Sure. So hopefully I've caught everything there. Councillor Jennings, uh, Jenkins, sorry. Could we just add in the um, response from the climate team um, so that we can see that in, in writing as well. And I just wonder if we've got any technical expertise on looking at battery, looking at the the possibility of the battery that might be um, employed. Right, thank you. Uh, you heard what uh, David said, and uh, Councillor Hazelwood has proposed that it needs to be deferred. Anyone to second? Councillor Jones, all in favour? Anyone against? Any abstentions? It's carried. Debbie, do you want to confirm? The words obviously was... Uh... <laughs> the vote was unanimous, Chair. Thank you. Right. Date and the time of the next meeting will be Thursday, the 25th of April at 1.30pm. So I will close the meeting. Thank you very much and have a safe journey.